So now we're going to move on to H133. Um, we don't have any witnesses listed, as you can see, um, but I've asked Eric to discuss um, discuss some things with us. Um, I do want to let people know um, there are some documents posted on our website. Um, there are the new forms from the uh, judiciary's website, the complaint and affidavit and explanation as to how these um, have changed from before. There is a um, letter from Will Moore, and I know uh, some of you, if not all of you, were copied on that. And then there is an email from the Defender General. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Sure. Nice to see everybody. Good afternoon. It's uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, here to talk some about uh, H-133, which, uh, as the committee knows, is an act relating to emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms. Uh, I guess I should ask the chair how, how you want me to go about this first, uh, which I think the couple of topics that I'm thinking of are you wanted to review the state v. Mish opinion that was uh, issued last Friday and maybe take a look at also 20 VSA 2307, which is the storage firearm storage statute. Those are the two things I'm, I'm uh, thinking that you might want to get to first, but I wasn't sure which order you you might want to talk about them in. Right. Um, I think in terms, maybe do the storage first and, um, you know, again, briefly um, in terms of, uh, I don't have the citation in front of me, but the storage bill, how it, it um, how it works uh, together with, um, with the RFA statute in terms of referencing the RFA statute and, and um, describes a, a process. So sure. I think, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll pull up the statute. I'll, I'm going to share the document. I think it's 20 VSA 2307, I think, but we'll see in just yeah. a moment. Yeah, um, that, actually, I have it now, so that is correct. Right. Um, uh, Evan, could you make me a co-host, please? Thank you. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at the language itself. As the, as the chair was mentioning, there is an interplay between this existing statute and the uh, relief from abuse order uh, RFA statute uh, that uh, pre-exists the bill that you're looking at now. This is its current law, and you'll see that uh, there's an interaction between the uh, the existing statute on firearm storage and the RFA process. So this is 20 VSA 2307, which is the existing statute. You see the title is Firearms Relinquished Pursuant to Relief from Abuse Order. So that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> the, the, and I'll say in the big picture for a moment before we look at the language, that this statute deals with how uh, a firearm that's relinquished pursuant to an RFA, which is also what you've been looking at in uh, section uh, 1104, how uh, firearm relinquished uh, in the, under those circumstances uh, has to be stored and handled. Now that's what it does deal with. In other words, if a firearm is relinquished pursuant to an RFA, here's what uh, must be done with it. What it doesn't say is uh, the court, you know, as of this statute hereby has the authority to order relinquishment. It doesn't authorize the relinquishment, but it does provide processes for have to occur if the relinquishment happens. So that's the idea behind it. It doesn't say courts have the authority to do this, uh, but it sort of assumes that, they, that that's going to happen, or at least in the case that they do happen, uh, sets out a, a procedure that has to be followed with the firearm when it's relinquished. So that's the, the background as to how this, the statute works and what the, the uh, interrelationship that it has with um, the RFA language. So if you look at, skip the definitions for a moment and look at subsection B1 there, it sort of essentially gets into what I was just describing and says that a person who is, who is required to relinquish firearms, ammunition, or other weapons by a court order issued under 15 BSA chapter 21 abuse prevention, and that's where 1103 and 1104 are, the statutes that we've been looking at, the statute that's proposed to be amended uh, in H133 is right there in chapter 21, the abuse prevention statute. So um, again, the language here uh, uh, says a person who is required to relinquish a firearm under that statute, in other words, is ordered to relinquish pursuant to an RFA, 
or uh, sort of provides an alternative there, another provision consistent with federal law, shall, unless the court orders an alternative relinquishment pursuant to subdivision two, and this is key here. So I should, again, quick big picture for a second. There's three ways that the person uh, might uh, relinquish or transfer possession of the firearm according to the statute. And the three ways are give it up to uh, a law enforcement officer when the order is served. So in other words, the law enforcement officer comes and says, here, I'm serving this uh, RFA, this uh, relief from abuse order. And at that time, when the order is served, uh, the person, that's one option, relinquish the firearms right then. Another option is that the court can order that the person relinquish uh, to a third party, a person, the uh, owner of the firearms can designate, say they want, you know, whatever, it could be a family member, could be a friend, uh, can uh, hang on to the weapons for them while the, while the order is in effect. So that's another option. And the third option is that uh, the person can relinquish to a federally licensed firearms dealer. So there's uh, a program in place under which uh, the FFLs, the federally firearms federally licensed firearms dealers uh, can store firearms for people who have them uh, have to turn them over because they're subject to a relief from abuse order. So those are your options to law enforcement, to uh, an FFL or to some other designated person if you have somebody who can hold on to it and can meet the criteria that we're about to see. So uh, that's the, the big picture. So that's what the language here says. If, the person's, if you're required to relinquish the, the firearm under this RFA, um, you have to either uh, give it to a law enforcement officer when the order is served or to uh, an approved federally licensed firearms dealer unless the court orders this alternative relinquishment under subdivision two that you see right there. And we don't need to go through all the details, but that's just the option of the third person. If, you know, that's the... the the big picture of this. The court can order that the person relinquish the firearm to a person other than the law enforcement officer of the FFL if the court makes certain findings with respect to this nominated third party. Um, and they, the court, uh, and if the court finds that, that relinquishment to that third party will not adequately protect the safety of the victim, well, then they can't do it. But uh, the, this third party um, has to sign an affidavit, and this is sub, subdivision B. They have to sign an affidavit that says they acknowledge receipt, they assume responsibility for storage, uh, they specify the manner in which they're going to provide secure storage, they have to attest that they are not prohibited from owning or, or possessing firearms under state or federal law, so in other words, they themselves are not, uh, you know, convicted felon or convicted of some other crime that would, would prohibit a person from possessing. Uh, and lastly, in sub Roman numeral four, they, they understand the obligations and requirements of, of the order of what they're doing. Um, and subdivision C there, they uh, are going to be subject to civil contempt proceedings if they allow uh, the person who's not supposed to have the weapon, you know, in other words, the person on whom, on whose behalf they're holding it, uh, if they let that person take it back, um, then they can be subject to civil contempt proceedings or if they don't otherwise follow the requirements of uh, this third party storage. Um, another key point of this is that. Uh, uh, fees. I'm skipping subsection C there. That just provides that the, the the rules for how this program is going to work are governed by the Department of Public Safety's uh, rules that they issue uh, and that they have issued already, um, or they're supposed to have anyway. I guess I haven't seen the rules myself. I assume they have. Uh, the and, but there's fees permitted as well. And now I'm in subsection D here. Uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, firearms dealers uh, can charge fees for this storage. You'll see that there's some uh, maximum fees enumerated for law enforcement agencies in D1, $200 for the first weapon, $50 for each additional weapon up to 15 months, um, $50 for each year thereafter. The dealers don't have a specified maximum for fee. It just uses the term reasonable amount or storage fee that is reasonably related to the expenses it incurs. Eric? That's for, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess this is not necessarily for you, but anybody. I thought I heard last week something about um, there isn't fees on storage of firearms that were were relinquished. That's I think, and it's getting there. Another, I think <laughs> for the emergency order, which you see in in subdivision three, there 
it says fees. Okay, okay yeah, if you're going to get to it, yeah, that's great. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. But that's a that's a crucial distinction, and that's the next point I was going to get to. Anyway, uh, again, the, you get the max for, for law enforcement agencies and FFLs have uh, the ability to to charge fees for storage, um, but uh, under subdivision three, you'll see that the fees are only permitted after the court issues a final relief from abuse order. So in other words, the temporary order, which is the one that this committee has been looking at, you know, the order that's only in effect for 14 days, there is no uh, ability to charge fees for that 14 day window, remember? So, so there's a 14 day maximum that the emergency order can be in effect for. And during that period of time, um, the authorization for fees is not there. But if at the end of that 14 day period, remember there has to be a hearing and then there's gonna be a question of, of whether or not um, a final RFA should issue a final order. And uh, that can be, there's no actually maximum am amount of time that that uh, has to be for. It's often that they're for a year is a common amount, but it, but it can vary, we've seen them for five years. Uh, the, the, um, ability to charge fees then kicks in. So if the final order is issued, then the law enforcement agency or the uh, federal firearms dealer can charge the fee. So does that respond to your question, Representative Burdett? Yeah, I, I've got to learn to be more patient and just listen. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank Yeah, so thank you, Eric. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that's the, that's the, the, the most of it, the gist of it, really, the, uh, you know, you have some other provisions related to the same thing. Subdivision F makes sure, clarifies that, uh, you know, the final order has to specifically say that once the order expires, the person's firearms have to be given back. They have to be returned after the order expires and the order has to say that, um, there are provisions about, um, you know, what's gonna happen if the person doesn't turn up to get them back, there's an authorization. If they don't turn up within 90 days, they can put the firearm up for sale. Um, the, the, uh, there's a three day window for after the, after the order expires that the agency or the dealer has to make them available to re return to the owner within three days. So it has to, there has to be a quick turnaround. Um, so uh, Eric, this, uh, um, yeah. On the maybe sold uh, for fair market value piece, say uh, somebody doesn't show up for the 90 days and, and, uh, and, and, you know, during this whole thing had moved, say, out of state, can't make it back. Would it, uh, since it is a may, is it potentially, uh, I mean, not, I don't want to oversimplify it, but uh, as simple as a phone call and maybe, of course, you'd have to get it uh, um, recorded somehow that you made contact, but it, uh, can it be extended fairly easily? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I don't, you know, as a practical matter that, uh, you know, may well depend on the exact types of communication, you know, did, did they really, you know, made sure that it, it actually happened, did they get the message, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, it's, it's at and absolutely is a may, not a shall. So that the the uh, window is there for someone who's making a good faith effort, you might say, uh, uh, to get the firearm back and say, "Hey, I can't get there for another two weeks." Absolutely permits the the court and the agency or the dealer to say, "Okay, we'll hold it for you know a little a little you know, a while longer." You know, they can work out whatever agreement they 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 want to work out essentially. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. That's pretty much what I have on on the statute and how it it interacts with. Uh, That's great. With the statute, or sorry, the the bill that your committee is looking at. That's great. That that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Shall I uh, turn to the State v. Mish case with that, or do you want to? Yes, uh, please. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not hearing anybody jumping in or anything. So yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Let me see if I can pull this up uh, somewhere here. What did I do? Oops. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so the uh, the one thing I just said sort of before getting into the case, I'm sure most folks have probably heard that the that the Vermont Supreme Court uh, handed down this decision uh, last Friday, only a few days ago now, 
Uh, but you may recall that earlier last week when I walked the committee through, uh, for example, some due process issues related to, to H-133 and some questions about whether or not the, the relinquishment or seizure process that H-133 contemplates would be um, permissible under the due process clause of the, of the United States Constitution and talked about you know, a person's right to have notice in a hearing before uh, property is taken and uh, that sort of thing. You may recall at the very end of that discussion, I said uh, that to a certain extent, um, we would find out more about these issues very soon because, uh, well, I didn't say very soon, I said soon, and because that there was both uh, probably the United States Supreme Court was due to act in this area, but more, more immediately that there were these two pending cases before the Vermont Supreme Court having to do with challenges to the to the um, large capacity magazine statute and that we would get a decision about those sometime and we would know more about what the court had to say about firearms regulation. Well, little did I know that 48 hours later, <laughs> that was when uh, the decision would come out. I, I honestly had no idea when I said that, but uh, um, happened pretty quickly right afterward. It was, I can't I think it was uh, Tuesday. I was in the committee talking about and made that, uh, made that statement and then the decision came out Friday. So um, so a nice segue, I suppose. The, the, uh, the court did have plenty to say about the regulation of firearms and I, I uh, will transition right into now to, to a summary of what the decision said and what, it, how, what impact it might have on H-133 generally. Uh, so the case was called State v. Mish and that, uh, in that case, the defendant uh, was charged with violating the Vermont's statute that prohibits the possession of large capacity magazines, which are sometimes called LCMs. And these uh, large capacity magazines uh, are defined in 13 VSA 4021. Remember that statute was passed in 2018, just a couple of years ago. And they're defined to be 10 rounds of ammunition for a long gun, 15 rounds for a handgun. And with some exceptions, including a grandfathering clause and a few other exceptions for law enforcement, et cetera, uh, they are prohibited. Uh, so if you didn't, if you aren't grandfathered in, he, these LCMs, these large capacity magazine possession uh, is illegal. It's a one year misdemeanor, I believe. Uh, so the defendant challenged the statute as violating Article 16 of the Vermont Constitution, which provides, and there's the quote, quoted language, the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. I should note right there that the challenge was very specifically under the Vermont Constitution, Article 16. It was not a second amendment case uh, under the due process clause, uh, uh, sorry, under the uh, Second Amendment uh, to the United States Constitution. So it was not a federal constitutional issue. Uh, it was Article 16, a state constitutional issue only. So whatever the, what the court said here uh, really has no bearing on what a federal court might say uh, with respect to a Second Amendment challenge, other than it might be, you know, uh, guidance. It might be interesting, but the courts uh, are separate and uh, would be analyzing it under their own standards and their own tests. But under the Article 16 of the Vermont Constitution, the uh, holding of the Vermont Supreme Court in this case was quite clear. And that's what you see highlighted in yellow. If you, if you ever want to, this is a direct quote from the opinion. So if you're ever looking for sort of a paragraph that summarizes exactly what the court said in this case, here it is. I'm going to read it uh, verbatim since it is exactly the holding. That we first determined that Article 16 protects a limited right to individual self-defense. So that means the first point is that Article 16 isn't just protecting sort of a general firearms uh, possession right in connection with a state-sponsored militia or something like that. It's an individual self-defense. So they, they say, yes, that Article 16 does protect uh, a limited right to individual self-defense and that the proper standard for Article 16 challenges is a reasonable regulation test. So what they're doing in that first sentence is they're having to figure out what is the scope of the right? You know, that's the first clause. Well, the scope of the, the right scope does include individual self-defense, and what's going to be the standard for determining how to review, say, a state law, say a law passes or that uh, you know has some impact on firearms. How does the court decide whether or not a law uh, is okay, a permissible regulation, or whether it might violate this right that they've just articulated, this right to self-defense? And the court says, all right, the standard for reviewing uh, a, an Article 16 challenge, a statute, say, that that does that is a reasonable regulation test. So that's what it's called, the reasonable regulation test. And then they say, under this test, we will uphold a statute implicating the right to bear arms, provided 
It is a reasonable exercise of the state's power to protect the public safety and welfare. So that's the reasonable regulation. It has to be a reasonable uh, regulation of uh, the, the public health, safety, and welfare. So they apply that standard. We apply that standard. We conclude that Section 421, that's the large capacity magazine statute, satisfies that reasonable regulation test because the statute has a valid purpose, all right? Step, step one's got a valid purpose of reducing the lethality of mass shootings. Point two, the legislature was, in, it was within its authority in concluding that the regulation promotes this purpose. So in other words, the, the prohi pro prohibition on large capacity magazines does promote their purpose of reducing lethality. We'll get to this in a minute, but the reason that they that they reached that conclusion is because they say there was plenty of evidence from which to conclude that uh, making large capacity magazines illegal will make mass shootings uh, less deadly and cause fewer injuries. So given that, they say, all right, as you see in that sentence right there, that the, the legislature, based on that evidence, uh, was within its authority to conclude that, all right, this prohibition promotes our purpose of reducing lethality. And lastly, uh, the statute leaves ample means for Vermonters to exercise their right to bear arms and self-defense. So in other words, uh, it's not making illegal all firearms or, or uh, making it impossible to possess any firearm for self-defense. It's, it's a prohibition on a particular type of device, this large capacity magazine. So that's uh, uh, the nutshell of what the court held up. So we're gonna zip through some more details here, but uh, as I say, it's nice to have that handy dandy one paragraph summary of what the court's result was in the Mish case. And as it happened, this was the very first case in which the court was, was defining the scope of its right to bear arms under, under Article 16 and to set forth the standard to determine whether a law infringes on that right. There had been a couple of cases when the court had talked about Article 16 before and it had, it had reached decisions based on particular facts and particular uh, a statute in one case and, a, and an ordinance in the other, but it never talked about it. It never gone into, the, into great detail about um, you know, what, what is exactly the scope of the right under Article 16? Does it expressly protect an individual right to self-defense? Which, as we just saw, it answered that question. Yes, it does. And, and what is the standard to review? And it, and it provided information on that. And it makes some sense if you think about it. Remember the, the, uh, uh, the federal the United States Supreme Court case that I mentioned that for the first time recognized uh, an individual right to bear arms for self-defense under the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. That was only decided in 2008. And, and the, the recent development in how uh, these firearms provisions and constitutions are perceived has been the subject of a lot of litigation, but it's been a lot, you know, mostly over the last, oh, I don't know, decade or so, roughly, and there've been a lot of cases on it, talking about it. But just in that sense, it makes some, some sense that, uh, that the Vermont Supreme Court as well hadn't, hadn't um, had occasion to really talk expressly about, well, what does this right exactly mean? You know, what, what are its what are its uh, boundaries and you know, how do we analyze statutes that might impact it? So um, uh, the Mitch case, as well as a companion civil case that I'll mention in a moment uh, that came up at the more or less the same time, provided the court with the opportunity to state uh, quite clearly and analyze in detail uh, what, these, what these provisions mean. And to do that, the court, what you ask, well, what did the court look at? Well, it looked at the text of the, you know, the language itself, the history and it went back at a lengthy historical uh, discussion. I'm not going to go into that de in detail now. The, it's a 51 page, very detailed, very uh, uh, carefully thought out opinion. And uh, you can certainly read some of those provisions yourself, but I'm just mentioning sort of what they talked about. So it was the history, case law in Vermont, construction of similar provisions in other state constitutions. They talked about that. Any other empirical evidence, re evidence sorry, if relevant. Um, and on the basis of those factors, the, the court concluded that Article 16 does protect uh, a right to bear arms in individual self-defense subject to reasonable regulation. So now that obviously, in a sense, begs the question, right? If, if, it, uh, if the, the right to bear arms for individual self-defense uh, is protected by Article 16 subject to some reasonable regulation, well, the question that obviously would, would uh, naturally be led to is, well, where does that line get drawn? Right. How, how do you where, you know, a given statute, for example, um, that may impact the right to bear arms? How does one decide whether it's an unconstitutional infringement on that right to, 
uh, self-defense or a reasonable regulation, right? Because it could be one or the other. There has to be a line between them somehow. And that's what the court had to figure out next, which is, okay, what standard of review has to be applied to determine whether you know a regulation is an unconstitutional violation of Article 16 because it infringes on this right to bear arms or uh, whether it's a reasonable regulation. So again, it looks at uh, Article 16's history and the court's own previous decisions, and it reaches the conclusion that the state reasonable regulation test, which I just mentioned, is the, the most appropriate standard for Article 16 challenges. And it sort of it reached that conclusion because it really pointed out that the right to bear arms under Article 16 was subject to, to various uh, reasonable legislative laws and restrictions going back to the mid to late 1800s. And it cited several statutes, some of which still exist now uh, in Title 13 in the weapons statutes. You know, for example, negligently uh, pointing a firearm at another person. Um, a couple of these, not in exactly the same form verbatim, but several of these statutes have been around since the 1800s. And the court uh, used that uh, historical uh, point to say that, well, this the right to to bear arms then has has not been absolute. It's rather it's been subject to, to legislative restrictions for you know uh, 150 years or so, uh, or um, yeah, almost uh, yeah, something that roughly. I'm um, not going to try and follow through with that math, but I think that's right where I was. Uh, so it also distinguished it in that in that uh, same discussion from other individual rights in the Constitution. You now, for example, whether it's the right to free speech or the right to free exercise of religion or whatever it may be. And sort of articulated this distinction that that uh, the exercise of the right to bear arms, and I'm looking at this quoted language here at the end of that paragraph, is by its very nature is associated with serious risks of harm to uh, to self and others. So, in other words, you know, the firearms right has that potential, and for that reason, uh, according to the court, it was uh, uh, subject to reasonable legislative regulation as well. So. Uh, the court reaches that conclusion and then has to really discuss, well, what does that mean, right? What does the reasonable regulation test mean? And uh, the court goes on to explain that and says that the government may regulate firearms under this test under its police power as long as its exercise of that power is reasonable. And it's not reasonable if it effectively abrogates Article 16. So in other words, if it essentially uh, you know, makes the Article 16 uh, a nullity, makes it the right to bear arms non-existent, and that's obviously not going to be reasonable. Um, but I'm continuing on here. Uh, the test does analyze whether the statute at issue is a reasonable limitation on the right to bear arms, and it focuses on the balance of the interests at stake. So it uh, really looks at uh, the different interests that are going to be involved in a legislative attempt to regulate firearms. And under, under this uh, test, as the court goes on to say, the right to bear arms may be, quote, regulated, but not prohibited. So regulated, but not prohibited. That's a, a key distinction. And, and Eric, the court, yeah. Yeah, well, um, if you had already said it, I apologize. I, I lost my internet there for a few minutes. But uh, so what's the definition of police power? The police, the police power is the right to protect the general health and welfare of the public. It's, uh, uh, it's an inherent legislative power, actually. You may remember that... Uh, I think, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, we were talking a little bit about inherent judicial power. Uh, the, the police power is generally recognized as, as one, of, one of the, some many courts say it's the most important power that the legislative power, branch of government has, but it's, it's the power to protect the general health and welfare of the citizens. Great, thank you. Yeah. And, um, actually, excuse me, I do see that coach's hand is up, Eric. Thank you. Uh, sorry to interrupt. This is a great explanation. Uh, is this going to be in your papers for today's testimony? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I sent it to um, to Evan, and it's it's uh, online, so you can look at it anytime. Uh, thank you very much. This is really enjoyable. Oh, good. Glad glad it's helpful. Um, so yeah. So uh, uh, the the key point that the that the court indicates that has to be looked at when deciding whether or not this is a reasonable exercise of the police power this this power to protect the health and welfare of the citizens is whether there's a reasonable fit on the highlighted yellow language on top there whether there's a reasonable fit between the purpose 
and the means of legislation. Now, this is an important point, too, that I, uh, I noticed as well, that the court specifically said this. This is a, a more deferential standard to state legislatures than the standards that are used by federal courts analyzing the Second Amendment. This is this provides more deference to findings that the legislatures make. The, the federal courts use a more, when, in the cases since Heller in 2008, um, and, and in that case, the United States Supreme Court did not articulate, by the way, what the standard should be to analyze cases under the Second Amendment. They left that to the lower courts to work out. And uh, there's been some mix of opinion about that between the lower courts, but it's certainly the standard of review that's used in the federal courts is, is uh, uh, more, more strict, more rigorous uh, than, than the reasonable regulation standard that the Vermont Supreme Court has is, is articulated here. And the court specifically said that, 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 um, that this standard was more deferential to state legislatures than the federal federal court standard. So that's an interesting point to keep in mind, because as I say, this challenge was under Article 16 of the Vermont Constitution. Um, you know, there could well be separate challenges to, to this statute, the, the large, capacity mag large, capac large capacity magazine statute, or, or other state firearm statutes under the Second Amendment in federal court. So, you know, whether or not they would reach the same result is uh, impossible to say, but it's just good to keep in mind that we have these two separate constitutional systems going on and two separate analyses. So um, so what does this reasonableness mean? And when the when the court's talking about that, and it goes on to explain that, because that's obviously very important to to what, Eric, uh, Eric. Yeah. Um, what, what you were you were just saying about the two different um, constitutions, and, and I had a question on my mind that I think I know the answer to, but kind of relates to that. So Vermont has uh, the Supreme Court has ruled as far as the high capacity magazines go. And I heard someplace along the way that the, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court may be looking at it uh, sometime soon, whether that's a year or two, I, I don't know. So if, if the Supreme Court rules that it's, it's unconstitutional to ban high capacity magazines, I guess one, does, does that trump Vermont? And um, I, I guess if it does, I, I thought states were um, autonomous. Say that one more, one more time, Rep. Burdett, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, so does does the Supreme Court ruling trump Vermont's on that? And, and if it does, you know, if they did uh, uh, overturn the ban on high capacity magazines, uh, again, do they, does it, the Supreme Court trumps Vermont ruling? And, and if it does, uh, uh, just raises another question with me as far as uh, I thought states were autonomous and could do um, um, not what they want, but uh, maybe, maybe you understand what I'm saying. No, I do. Yes, exactly. And yes, it, it's, it's uh, an interesting being in a you know, federal system where, where two different constitutions apply. You know, states are independent sovereigns. But uh, you know, conduct can't violate either the state constitution or the federal constitution. So if, if the uh, United States Supreme Court were to hold that the, that the uh, large capacity magazine prohibition violated the Second Amendment, then yes, that would, that would essentially trump. That would uh, say that even though it, it, the Vermont Supreme Court had found that it was okay under the state's, state constitution, it nevertheless violated the federal constitution and um, would still be unconstitutional for that reason. So I guess, uh, so, so I said uh, autonomous and you said sovereign, I think we're talking about the same thing. So, so in a case like this, why wouldn't the state, um, oh, because it's, forget it because it's violating U.S. Constitution or U.S. Right. Supreme Court. Okay. All right. Yeah. A little, just a little confusing to the lay person, but I think I got it. No, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's one of the complications of living in a sort of a dual system of dual sovereignty. You know, you have uh, independent uh, sovereigns, both state and federal. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the court goes on to explain that, that uh, and it's talking about reasonableness now, because remember all of this is sort of based on this issue of reasonableness. Uh, it says in the exercise of the state's police power, reasonableness requires that the purpose of the enactment be in the interest of the public welfare. That's what I was mentioning. You know, it has to be the public safety and welfare. 
and that the methods utilized bear a rational, a rational relationship to the attended, intended goals. So there has to be this connection between the goal and whatever method the legislature chose to use. And it goes on, this highlighted section here, I think is very important. In assessing reasonableness, therefore, and this is a quote from the court's opinion, court should consider the importance of the state's goals, the reasonableness of the connection between the goals and the means chosen, and the, the degree to which the regulation burdens the exercise of the right to bear arms for self-defense. So there's three things to, to think about in the analysis there of whether it's reasonableness. Well, how, what's the state's stated goal? What's the connection? Is there a reasonable connection between the state's goal and the legislation? In other words, the, the statute that the legislature enacted to say, here's how we're gonna try and address this problem. Here's how we're gonna try and meet this goal. Is there a connection between what the goal is and what the, what the legislation does? And uh, you know, to what extent does it burden the right to bear arms for self-defense? Um, as I mentioned, that this test doesn't tolerate a statute that effectively abrogates Article 16 and renders the right to bear arms a nullity, so it can't go that far. Um, uh, but reasonable regulation, according to the court, is, is going to be okay. And, and it's interesting here, and this goes back to the point I just made about how the court said that their standard is more deferential to the legislature than the federal standard, because it talks quite a bit about how deference to the legislature is a key component here. They say uh, you know, that although our inquiry looks to an actual balance of interests, remember they kind of look at the interest, the competing interests here, rather than actual interests, rather than merely a hypothetical conceivable one, it does not override our general deference to the legislature on matters within its authority. So this next sentence is very, very uh, key to that. The question for courts is not whether we would strike the same balance as the legislature. No, they don't have to say, oh, well, we would, we would weigh those facts differently but it's whether the legislature's choices are anchored to a real as opposed to a hypothetical foundation. So in other words, if there's a, a basis for the legislature's conclusion as to why uh, it's enacting the statute and the connection that it has to, to, the, to remedying the problem, addressing the purpose, then the court's probably not gonna disturb that. And they go on to say, um, you know, again, they're distinguishing between some hypothetical conceivable purpose and, and some actual connection they say, although you know, will not we will not uphold a law restricting the right to bear arms on the basis of hypothetical rationales for which there is no basis, or which are overwhelming, overwhelmingly refuted by contrary evidence. Vermont courts will not second guess the legislature's weighing of the facts and information supporting its enactments when its legislation is supported by adequate evidence, in light of the constitutional rights potentially implicated by its legislation. So it's very deferential to a uh, fact gathering process that the legislature undergoes when it's passing a statute. So then it takes these principles that we just described and applies them to section 421, the prohibition on, um, on large capacity magazines. And it goes through the test that we, we just described. They conclude that the, le the legislature had this purpose of reducing the potential for injury and death from mass shootings. All right, that was the purpose by, by prohibiting LCMs. And they say this was a proper legislative purpose within the police power to protect the public welfare. So obviously protecting public health and well-being uh, by it was the part was the purpose was the goal. And they say that is uh, uh, a proper exercise of the protection of the general public, which is the police power. And they say and that this large capacity magazine ban had a rational relationship to that purpose. Why? Well, because there was sufficient evidence to permit the legislature to conclude that limiting magazine capacity would further that goal by reducing lethality and injuries in mass shootings. So in other words, and they say this specifically in the opinion, they're not saying oh, the evidence absolutely supports that conclusion. They're, they're being deferential to the legislature and saying there was sufficient evidence for the legislature to reach that conclusion. And uh, they're not gonna, as they say, they're not gonna substitute their judgment uh, to the for that of the legislature as to whether they would strike the same balance. They're not going to do that. They're not going to second guess the legislature's weighing of their of the facts and information. They're not going to do that either. As long as there is adequate evidence. Now again, it's not they're saying you can't just have hypothetical rationales or no evidence. You can't do that. But um, if there's evidence from which the legislature could reach that conclusion, you know, they're not going to disturb that uh, that conclusion uh, by by the General Assembly. So um, in this case, they said there was evidence that the legislature had when it passed 
uh, Act 55, or S55, I should say, um, in 2019. And uh, as well, it goes on to finally conclude that uh, the burden on the right to bear arms for self-defense was minimal because other types of firearms were not prohibited. In other words, it was a ban on large capacity magazines, but not other types of firearms. Um, and therefore, uh, the statute did not violate Article 16. Um, and I just want to, this is my very last, last point here, I just want to make here, because this sort of segues us into H-133 a little bit, because in a footnote, uh, the court specifically said in the opinion, and this, this is verbatim, this is a quote, and in fact, most of this outline that you're looked at, looked at, I mean, I've done little bits of, you know, minor editing here and there and, and paraphrasing here and there, but, but a good chunk of this is just quotes from the opinion itself. And this is one right here from uh, footnote 21 on page 35. The court says we do not address in this decision the factors to be considered. And, and, and then and I should say, pausing for a moment, what they're doing here is they're saying, they're telling us what kinds of cases they are not deciding. This is a case about large capacity magazines, in other words, and, and whether or not uh, those a prohibition on those devices would violate Article 16. The court is explaining here, but here's what we're not deciding. Here's what uh, is not before us. And they say, uh, we're not addressing um, in this decision the factors to be considered in determining whether other kinds of provisions potentially impacting the right to bear arms, and then it lists some specifically, such as limitations on where individuals can possess firearms. Think about it. You have those in Vermont statute already, right? You have them for prohib uh, you can't possess firearms uh, in schools or on school grounds or in courthouses, for example. Those are both in Vermont statute already. Those sorts of limitations are not being uh, decided here, or regulations concerning the sale or transfer of firearms. Again, you have those in statute as well. For example, uh, firearms can't be sold to persons under 21. Uh, there have to be background checks whenever uh, firearms are sold. Those are all parts of the legislation that was passed in 2018. Those are also not being decided here. Requirements relating to securing or carrying firearms, or, and here's the one I've highlighted, or limitations concerning who may possess firearms. And that I highlighted because that is really the type of legislation you're looking at in H-133, right? That is about who can possess firearms. And their proposal uh, in H-133 is to make clear that uh, people who are subject to emergency relief from abuse orders can't possess firearms. And that's, again, uh, uh, within, the, within the category of types of cases uh, that the court's not addressing here. Um, and whether or not those would violate Article 16 you know, remains an open question. Uh, but uh, I think the analysis that that the court went through in the Mitch case uh, does, I think, uh, probably reminds people of the same discussion that the committee has had with respect to H-133. In other words, the the uh, test some testimony that you've heard about the connection between uh, uh, people who are subject to relief from abuse orders and uh, whether or not uh, those uh, firearms are used in lethal circumstances or in circumstances that injure people when uh, they are in danger of uh, uh, having to come to court and get an RFA. As I say, that that evidence has been before the committee, and I, that probably will have a bearing on whether or not um, uh, a similar challenge under Article 16 to the, the language that the committee is looking at would be upheld. Because there, again, the legislature, the, the case certainly was very deferential to the legislature, to the to the uh, conclusions that the legislature could reach based on the evidence that it heard, and um, in this case, I think the committee probably is able to to recollect well the evidence that it's that it's heard already with respect to um, relief from abuse orders and uh, potential uh, lethal and uh, injurious situations. And uh, probably using the Mitch standard, that's uh, you know, there's a good a good argument that that would that would support um, legislative regulation in this in this case as well. Again, not clear. Can't say that for certain. Uh, and the court specifically said they weren't deciding those kind of cases, but I think certainly that's the the uh, the argument that one would make if one were defending the H-133 legislation as well. So that kind of brings me to my end of that discussion. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. That was very helpful. Sure. Um, I see 
coach's hand is up, but I'm not sure if that's from before. And that was from before. Okay, great. And I, uh, let me just, okay. Tom's hand is up, it's a little, okay, once, um, okay, now I can see everybody. Great, okay, uh, Tom. Yeah, me again. <laughs> um, no, just a, a question that came to my mind, Eric. You got the uh, case against uh, Max Mish. Is it Mish? Is that the way it's pronounced, I guess? I think so. I always thought there was an N in it, but <laughs> until I saw this. <laughs> but anyway, so let's let's say he uh, there's a case against him. Uh, he's found guilty. Um, and then, say, uh, a year, that whatever his punishment is, say, uh, sake of argument, he's halfway through the punishment. And then the Supreme Court reverses the Vermont decision in a sense. What happens to a case like his? Do you understand what I'm saying? You can say no. <laughs> right. No, I think I understand, what, but I'm not sure the answer. It's a good question. Okay. Uh, I think I see what you're getting at is if, uh, let's say he's, uh, um, you know, convicted under this statute. Yeah, and then and then two years down the road, um, the U United States Supreme Court says, "Oh no, that that large capacity uh, magazine statute violates the Second Amendment." Um, then what happens to this particular conviction? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not I'm not sure the answer off the top of my head. Certainly, there would be a good a good ground for uh, an expungement petition. I would think. Um, but I'm just sort of thinking off the top of my head with that. I, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, it's an interesting one to look into. Right, right. Yeah. So what, I mean, we've changed, we've changed laws before, penalties before, and I got to believe someplace along, the, along those, uh, uh, those times that somebody was, was serving a sentence, you know, and then we changed a penalty. Um, did anything happen with them? I mean, that you, you may not even know or recall, but. No, you know, in general, you can't, you can't make a penalty more severe because that's an ex post facto clause violation. So you can't, you can't make a penalty more severe retroactively. Um, no, no, no. I'm thinking if the penalty was less. And, and generally uh, uh, there is a statute on that, that generally when, when penalties are, uh, are made less severe uh, so that they would uh, you know, retroactively reduce somebody's punishment, there is a, usually, a, uh, and I'm not sure exactly how the statutory process unfolds, but there is um, some allowance for that being applied retroactively. It can be. Okay. Um, so. But I, I, and it just crossed my mind that the, the thing, uh, that would that changes at all it's going from a state to a federal thing right yeah where that's where the big question would be i guess is because of that um small detail <laughs> right would it have any impact right okay yeah. great thank you yeah. okay well great eric thank you i think that that was really helpful appreciate that sure I'm not seeing either questions so Okay, all right, uh, committee, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to, if it works for Michelle, have her do a walkthrough on the changes to 195, then we'll take our break and then we'll hear from witnesses because Michelle is double booked. And uh, so does that work for you, Michelle? And then you'll be able sure. to go to the other committee. Okay, great. Yep, I'll go check in and then I'll come back. After. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. And um, uh, Evan, would you mind sharing the screen? With the amendment. Sure, no problem. Hang on a second. Thank you. So committee, this is H195 and we're looking at language that uh, attempted to narrow the um, the bill as, as introduced. Right. And um, sure. Tom, I see your hand is up. So, right, so just as a little refresher from our discussion last week, so the Attorney General's Office had put forth a proposal um, asking for the legislature to explicitly authorize 
the use of facial recognition technology with respect to certain types of crimes. But um, it, the way that they had originally presented it was encompassing uh, several different crimes. But then once we heard testimony, it was that those crimes were supposed to be um, only in the situations where the original investigation um, started out as an investigation into child exploitation under Chapter 64 of Title 13. So you'll see there the new language. So I tried to keep everything the same, but just clarify that the um, that the only way that it could be used in those additional offenses, which are sexual assault, homicide, uh, or kidnapping, was that if they originated with uh, the investigation originated with an investigation into child sexual exploitation. So you'll see uh, on line 12 in subsection A, so that's the notwithstanding language for the act last year that put the moratorium in place for facial recognition. Uh, so this is creating an exemption to that moratorium and specific authorization uh, for these, uh, for the use of facial recognition in these circumstances. And you'll see that um, uh, that it can be used by law enforcement during a criminal investigation into any of the following offenses, some subject to the limitations of subsection B. So the first one is the sexual exploitation of children. And then subdivision two is the crimes that I just mentioned, provided that the investigation into these offenses originated with an investigation into sexual exploitation of children. And then, uh, Evan, would you mind uh, going to the next page? So then subsection B um, has further limitations on the use of facial recognition technology, which is that if it's used in the circumstances that are authorized in subsection A, it can only be utilized uh, if law enforcement is in possession of an image of an individual who they believe to be a victim, a potential victim, or a suspect in the investigation, and the search is solely confined to locating images, including videos, of that individual within electronic media legally seized by law enforcement in relation to the specific investigation. So that was part of it. I've just kind of reorganized the structure there to get in the various elements and make it clear that you can't use it in cases of homicide, kidnapping, or sexual assault unless it originally ties back to the investigation for uh, child uh, sexual exploitation. And then uh, section two is that it's effective on passage. And, um, and so because of the narrowing of this language as opposed to the way that the bill was introduced, I've retitled it. So the title does not change until the act actually passed. And so for the new folks, this is just, it seems kind of weird, little dangly language there at the end uh, that's not underlined or have a section number, but if that's the way we do it is that after passage, the bill would be retitled and act relating to use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement in cases related to sexual exploitation of children. Great, thank you. Thank you very sure. much. Michelle. Thanks, Evan. Um, any questions for Michelle? We, um, after the break, we will be hearing from witnesses, but in terms of the language, uh, any questions for Michelle? Committee? Nope. Okay. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Not seeing any. Okay. So let's take a break, please, and come back at 2.30, and then we'll um, start with our witnesses on this.